this is going to be an unusual event um, because we're going to co-interview, aren't we? Yeah. I'm going to ask her questions, she's going to ask me questions because we thought it was just quite fun because you would think actors and directors spoke a lot. But oddly enough, they don't very much because when you get... They're just shouting notes at me from across the... Yeah, but the also w w the first time you meet in an audition, which is the first time we met, and then you're on the set, and so you don't have the moment where you talk about how you're quite meant to behave because the director's meant to know what he's doing and the actress is meant to know what she's doing. See, I wanted to ask you about acting because I, some writers and directors that I know, in order to understand how to write for actors, they've tried acting. Mm. Or tried acting and they're not been very good mm. and then become writers or directors. Mm. But, <laughs> so were you one of those, or were you actually yes. quite good and always wish you could have, or were like, how was that? Because you did a lot of plays at, un at school yeah. and uni, right? Yeah. So what happened was, but I heard the other day that basically all Harold Pinter wanted was for people to ask him to, to act. act. Yeah, mm. he had 50 years of disappointment. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was exactly my story. So I thought I was going to be an actor. I played, you know, Oberon and Hermione when I was <laughs> very touching Hermione, a little green velvet. Is that um, in a school play? Yeah, a school play. Yeah. And But I always knew that comedy was more potent. So I remember dying as Hermione and two people were meant to lift me off stage <laughs> and one of them just exited. So the other one grabbed my legs, pulled me off and my wig <laughs> came off and massive laughs. And I thought, that's, that's what I like. Um, but I know I had an interesting, the sort of story of my career is I thought I was going to be an actor and then I arrived at Oxford and I couldn't get cast in anything. It just turned out I was utterly bland. <laughs> and then I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll go, I'll do comedy stuff I write myself. And then the first show I did was with Rowan Atkinson, who was the greatest comedian of uh, our generation. And so I was utterly bland again. <laughs> and so I gave up. There's a good David Bowie story, isn't there, that you have about that? Yeah, so we were, I did, when Rowan did the West End, we did a sort of 12-week run of a sketch, of a, of, of a show, which I wrote, that I was in, for, that Rowan insisted on describing as a one-man show. And I used, to, <laughs> I used to complain. And then at one point, he said, all right, all right. And then I heard him being interviewed, and he described it as a one-and-a-half-man show. <laughs> and I said to him, all right, I, 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 I have it one man. And David Bowie came to see the show. And I was on stage for 50 minutes of the hour and 50. Doing, doing what? Though? Just like Man in Q, other guy in the Mr. Bean sketch. Yes. So like Man uh, on Beach. It's but, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, dance, a new bit of that. And Bowie came back at the end, uh, you know, my total hero. And Rose said, he came into Rose's dressing room and Rose said, and this is Richard, and he looked at me, and without a flicker of recognition. <laughs> He'd been looking directly at me, but he hadn't seen me <laughs> during the show. No, you, I, that's because I, you probably played Anonymous Man really well. But that, I was like <laughs> sitting like this. Yeah. There were just two people. And, and, and then he said, music was great. Because uh, he assumed I was the guy who'd been sitting behind the stage <laughs> playing that thing. But um, you, just to, if we're talking about failure... I think you failed to get into various acting schools because mm. of your lack of, of acting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? I tried loads, actually. And actually, I got, even at uni in my first year, I never got any parts. I was always hopeless. I even tried for a musical, and I'm a horrible singer. And I remember doing a particularly bad rendition of Summertime, you know, that jazz song. Mm. Um, for guys and dolls, weirdly. And Which that. is d summertime's not in guys. And no, dolls, I know. I don't. That may be the reason you didn't I, get the part. I mean, you were singing actually, a song from the wrong musical. I, <laughs> I think I am. Um, I think that was a song that I always just trotted out. Mm. Drama school auditions, yeah. all of it. Pretty nasty. It was nasty. Um, what did they yeah. say? Why? Do you know why? Did they say too posh? For <gasps> or. or I get really offended by posh, you know. You're the second poshest person I've ever is met. Is that true? Yeah, seriously. It's like, it's like, oh, dear enough, it's like Princess Margaret. The Queen's the poshest person. That's why they cast you, because you're the second then? poshest person. Who's the poshest? 
well, I suppose the the the, the, <laughs> the queen. either the queen or Claire Foy, but um, <laughs> Margaret's dead, so you've just so stepped that. in. Um, so when did you first show any glimmer of the talent that is now so evident? Um, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Backtracking horribly. Um, okay, so I did, well, I did lots of horrible school plays, which mum and dad's had through, so they're somewhere here. Um, and um, yes, I, I remember actually, it w I was actually in another production of Guys and Dolls at school and realised that actually it was, I was, I was, I was sort of like, eighth row to the back in some ensemble part and I was, couldn't sing anyway so I used to just mouth it um, and then I went to my drama teacher and said can you do can we do a production of Hamlet and so we did an all girls production of Hamlet and um, I thought it was quite good but actually mum found the video of it and it's actually but what did you play? Gertrude I played Gertrude uh, yeah uh, good part yeah good part um, but it was in that moment actually it was like behind um why are you sniggering? I don't, it's such a, <laughs> You're I mean, it's it. not, because I haven't seen any of these all female Shakespeare's. Yeah. But I'm just thinking of three school well, girls. Well, you play Hermione, stage. so. I know, but three school girls on stage, one of whom's, you know, the same age as Hamlet, pretending to be his yeah, mum. Yeah, I know. And then Us another all the same girl's age, Hamlet's yeah. dad. Yeah. Yeah, with a beard? I think she was only Claudius because she had short hair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those. Um, but I just remember, do you know what? It was like a real. Um, one of those weird moments where I went off stage and I was actually thinking Gertrude's thoughts. Um, and that's when I realised, oh, that's what this is. It's thinking of somebody else. Yeah. And that became a sort of like really amazing thing. Because it is oh, a weird okay. job, isn't it? It's like people always are, I always wonder myself what the job actually is. It's, it's very odd because it's you, but it's not you. But it's you as somebody else. Yeah, I must admit, I wasn't thinking I'm the man on the beach. <laughs> uh, <laughs> next to Rowan. But did, is, I, I, there was no, there was no. Speaking of that, is that what is that where Mr. Bean came out of? So was that pro, what you that sketch you did? Was that actually Mr. Bean? Because our, my family, I mean, Mr. Bean is what we grew up yeah. on. So we decided let's develop a silent thing so that it is so normal good. monologues, and that's where we started Mr. Bean. And so. Mr. Bean was not Mr. Bean, that he was a schoolboy who was cheating, a guy on a beach and a bloke in a church who we didn't realise were the, the same, same bloke. And then they said, let's do a TV show. And we said, well, let's save on costume and make him, yeah, well make him the same bloke. Yeah. And that, because that, that is something that's like, because there's no words in it, it's just completely, it's like a global. Yeah. There's even a cartoon of it now, is that right? There is, yeah. Oh, and it's so funny that Rowan spends hours and hours in a booth going, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and he's such a perfectionist, apparently it's, you know, he goes, no, no, that's not right. <laughs> uh, ooh. <laughs> but anyway, talk, yeah. uh, we're moving away from my lack of talent. Yeah, so sorry. I'm sorry I haven't seen more of your stage work. I know you say that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but I've been busy at night. I know. Um, also, you slightly loathe. Can I I'll remind you of something? This just this just demonstrates the director actor relationship. You're looking worried now, I don't know why. Um, so I was doing a production when I was working with Richard on About Time, I was about to do a production of Three Sisters. And um, the director was this really um, brilliant. Australian director I've worked with twice, who I love very much. And um, he always does very modern, kind of rigorous, bold versions of it. And for the audition, I just had one really quick audition, in and out, it was really scary. I left thinking I'd never get the part. But he only had given us the first half of his version of it. And I remember seeing it, I think in Russian, years ago. Um, but because I didn't want to read a, a sort of original translation, sort of scholarly version, I just wanted to wait for Benix. I'd only read the first half of it. And maybe Wikipedia what happened because I forgot. Right. Anyway, the next day I was on set with you, and I was in. We were downstairs. We were waiting on set, and Rachel McAdams was sat there. It was a very really hot room, and I don't know why you were talking to Rachel about the scene. And then you said, "Oh, I've, uh, how was Three Sisters? I hear you might be doing it." I went, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." Like wanted to press because I knew that he'd done. You'd gone to Cambridge and done. So no, I saw a production of it. Maybe. No, no, yeah, that's right. But also, no, I was saying you did English literature yeah. at uni, right? Yeah. So like one of the most intelligent people in the world. And um, he went, oh, yeah, Three Sisters, that's the one with the, um, with the jewel, isn't it? And for some reason, I panicked, forgot what happened at the end, and went, no. And you went, 
well, I'm sure there's a jewel in Three Sisters. And I went, no, no, because I then couldn't change my, because then I thought I look even more stupid. So it's like, there's not a jewel in it. Trust me, Richard, there's not a jewel. And you're like, no, no, there is a jewel, because I remember seeing Timothy Spall, and Rachel McAdams was going like this. And, and you go, I remember Timothy Spall getting killed at the end because yeah. he was shot. And I was like, no, Richard, trust me, there is no jewel in Three Sisters. I'm about to cry, I'm sweating, beads coming out, literally like shaking. And Rachel's slowly sinking in, and you went, are you telling me you're doing a Chekhov play? You've got the part, you've auditioned for the part, and you don't even know what happens in it. <laughs> and, then, and then I went, no, well, I, and then you got called and you left, and I was dying on my own in this basement for hours before coming on set, and then I came on set, I was so embarrassed in front of him. And then I wasn't back on, on, um, on set for another two weeks. But and for two weeks, so then I did read it. Yeah. And there was a jewel. There was a jewel. Yeah. And for two weeks I was in at which home, Tim's ball dies. In which Tibbles dies. Yeah. And two weeks I went away and I was telling everybody. And I was like, oh, Mom, I just think Richard's going to think I'm the stupidest person ever. I mean, he's never going to cast me again for number one anyway. He's probably going to write me out of this. Or should be. And, I was, and I thought all these different scenarios when I came back on set, I was going to say, Richard, so you know, the reason why. <laughs> I didn't know, it's because Benedict's version. Anyway, so I came up to you and I was like, and make up trailer all morning, so nervous to see you. And I saw you and I went, Richard, so you know that, co that, that, that conversation we had about um, three sisters? And you went, no. <laughs> <laughs> and you had, you, did, you gave me the look that David Bauer gave you, you had yeah. no memory of it's that so funny, Wes, we're both scared of each other. Yeah. I'm terrified <laughs> of the actors. I mean, one of the things that I'm trying, uh, uh, Just as a director, I don't know. I mean, I think probably, th you know, theatre directors learn how to do it. But on set, I just wanted to ask you this, and we'll, go, we'll yeah. move on later. But you've got an actor. They've prepared what they're going to do. And the strange thing about movies is so much time, so much money, so much preparation, months casting. And then suddenly you've got about eight minutes. Mm. Sometimes even eight minutes to do the most important scene the person's doing. They come on. They do it badly. What do you do? Yeah. And that's the thing I want to say to you is you've prepared it. You think it's great. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> Should I just accept it? Or if I say that's not right, are you going to be so n nervous and broken yeah. because of the fact that I've just said it's bad that you'll be even worse? worse definitely. And we've only got one take of the bad performance. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and we should have at least got six takes of the bad performance rather than one take of the bad performance and then five takes of the atrocious performance <laughs> where you've lost all your confidence. How does that work? How do, how well, do, it definitely does break you, yeah, if, you're, if you say anything mean, yeah. You have to build up a resilience to it. But you're quite good at that, I thought. You're quite generous and... Um, but I've never managed particularly to turn... I mean, I around. do my best. I just do you know what? Actually, I do, do remember that. I do remember, if I recall, the kind of fear in your eyes of sort of when something's going desperately wrong. Was it with Donal in the coat? No. What, what was, was it with? I can't, I can't remember what it was. There's only a couple of times where I've seen you flapped. But for the most part, I don't... Yeah, I, I can I, fix it in I the I think edit. the key That's is for I a director not to show the actor how anxious they are. Yeah. And I think, part, I think the biggest part of being a director is being able to manage your own anxiety. Yeah. And not spread it among... Because we have enough of our own. Yeah. But I don't know. I, I never think anything I do is very good. And that's not being Tell me, I saw... I, I, how many of you seen Vanessa? Because she's been in endless things. Yeah, no. on stage. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, tell me about being Stella. Because I did go and see her, and she was extraordinary in Streetcar Named Desire, which she did with Ben Foster and Gillian Anderson. When yeah. you say that's what you've learned it is, were you that <laughs> abused girl in that sexual relationship every night for four hours? Or were you Vanessa saying, I must remember not to punch Gillian in the eye again? You mean, was I in the thoughts yeah, of it or yeah, not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you say you came off stage and you were Gertrude. It varies, really. Um... It varies. It can sometimes be random whether you're particularly focused. If there's people in the audience, I'm usually worse. I like not knowing if anyone's there. Because then they become like an anonymous group of kind of quite nice, supportive people. But if you think it's somebody that you care about, that's I always do. You get self-conscious, you get self-aware. Um, yeah, in and out. In right, and out. so sometimes there are good and bad. 
I was thinking doesn't... about this actually because streetcar is a long show and it's also it's really disturbing. Um, I was thinking about okay, so let's say let's say you do that twice a day sometimes. So that's sometimes six seven hours of that particular story. And if you were going to the gym and physically doing that, how much your body would change? So if you're doing the emotions of that, how much then your what that does to your psyche? Yeah. I sound like quite interesting. Are you in therapy now? <laughs> I am actually. <laughs> <laughs> Do you act yourself in the therapy? You say, I, I, I'm paying so much them. money, I better pretend I'm better. Uh, yeah, I I'm that. fine. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, I, we wanted to talk a little bit about auditions because we first met in an audition for a film. It's so unfair. You get people to turn up to auditions, to do an unnatural thing, to sit in front of you and act a part that they're not often after you've asked them about their life, um, it's a very false thing. And my theory about it is that you end up really casting the essence of the person that you see rather than whether or not they act it well. And one of the wonderful things about getting back together on Love Actually with the cast there is I remember casting you know, Kira Knightley as an 18-year-old girl thinking just she's a lovely 18-year-old girl. But when we reshot it, I realized she's got exactly the same qualities, now she's 30, of kind of innocence and sweetness that she had then. And I think what you're looking for is whether the person's got the sort of soul of the character rather than actually gets the lines And you right. can't act that either, yeah, which makes exactly. you feel better if you don't Because I think movies, you can see if someone really is that person. But uh, tell me a bit about <laughs> auditions. Are they horrible? Um, yes. Uh, what makes them less horrible? If you, if you, I mean, just doing lots and lots and lots of them until you get used to it. I mean, I can tell I'm so nervous because I'm fidgeting and um, it's also, it's really unnatural because most of the time you're not reading with an actor. So you're reading with a casting director or casting assistant. You're in a room, there's lots of lights or like, and there's three or four people on the sofa looking at you and a camera. And it's really hard to not be nervous and, and like want to just die. Um, and then for The Crown, actually, my screen test for Margaret, Stephen Daudry was just opening a play. So it was like in the attic of a theatre in West End. And it was Peter Morgan and four directors, the casting director and the casting assistant. Um, so that that's eight is people. scary. God. Eight people. And then like four directors plus Peter giving me notes. So you, by that point, I'd done so many auditions in my life um, and not got most of them and got some of them. And I think... I don't think that's very good acting in that audition, but I think what you said is that you must see that there's a potential for creating somebody who is would be right next to Rachel to play her best friend and right for the context of the... Which is, again, like a kind of... Um, I mean, what is that? What, how, do you, how do you cast people? Well, I, th I mean, I kind of know, in a way, what I'm looking for, which I think has turned out to be integrity realism, yeah. but a, a command of comedy things. You will never be able to make somebody funny. Uh, and so if you actually make us laugh just as a human, that helps. It's so frightening because it goes on and on, this process of casting. And it tends to be, yeah, maybe four of you in a room, director, um, Emma Freud, who's with me here, who works on all the films, she'd be there, casting director. And when I was a writer, I was the writer and there was the director. And... It's not only tense for them, it's tense for you because you don't know what the other people in the room are thinking because you're all lying. You're all saying, oh, fabulous, oh, marvellous, that's the best thing I've ever <laughs> seen. Know. And sometimes I would see the person for the part and they would go out of the room and I'd turn and go... And the, the others would go, yeah, no, that was no good, was it? <laughs> um, and you think, but no, that, yeah, uh, uh. And then other times they'd say, that's the person, we've got the person. And I'd say, that's the worst performance I've ever seen. So it is, it's a terrifying scenario. It is weird, isn't it? It's like, I remember thinking, it's like, it, it's like doing a job interview every single day. Yeah. The feelings of that. And you often think, why am I doing this to myself? Because it's so... What's the one that got away? with you? What, what parts? Can you confess to people here I'm what, trying you're, to think, what you're actually. not? Did you audition to play the Queen? No. I would have been hopeless. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean that. Now, we have to be very careful that we don't finish before we talk a bit about the crown. 
I've only, I've actually, I actually met Princess Margaret. Everyone's met Princess yeah. Margaret. <laughs> On a staircase in Buckingham Palace. I can't tell you how, how many times I hear that. Yeah. And I'll just tell you, what happened was, we walked down the staircase, Emma and me, and we were getting on pretty well. You she and was Mark. funny and yeah. witty. And Emma got overconfident mm. and said, would you like to see a picture of my daughter? Because I only gave birth three months ago. And she went, oh, Christ, no. Why would I want, <laughs> Why would I want to do that? So that was the person 40 years later. But talk a bit about the strangeness. Just living with someone like that, you know, like immersing yourself and knowing that you've got the second season and that you're going to kind of grow up with somebody. They, you live quite closely with, with that energy, whatever that is, yeah. But did you start to feel eating away inside you, all that sort of anger and disappointment and all those things? Was it quite a, not destructive thing, but it was a complicated thing to have in your life? Yeah, I've, I've, I felt like it, the first time I really felt like a character was like I was taking the character home with me because you're like embodying them or their feelings or whatever the, the weird job is. Um, was three sisters and that was a particularly destructive character. And I just found myself getting more irritable and my like the availability of anger in me was much greater. It was horrible for my housemates, my poor sister. Um, and with Margaret, you know what I was talking about in summers today, the, the thing that I um, had most was I felt inferior to Claire all the time. I felt like she was just amazing and much better and I always felt like not as good. Wow. And I and I I talked about it sometimes in interviews because the amazing thing about The Crown was the fact that we all felt like it, it, the, the, the world in which it was created, we all got to semi, we were immersed in it. It was a very immersive experience as an actor. So you were on location in these big houses that then became your natural habitat in the, um, you know, a bit like a sci-fi movie if you're going to a spaceship. Like all those were very alien sets and things like that to us, but we got to, it got to feel like it became ours and you stopped noticing where, how grand it was. So you kind of got used to it. And <clears throat> because at the costume designer was allowed to do amazing things and had the, the ability or the, was given not, not budget, but just the creative um, capacity to, to do her job to the best of her ability. It meant that we could choose f out of five fabrics, not just one, and we could design everything. Margaret would have had endless fittings for her. So then I, I was put in situations as Margaret. So for example, in the coronation, it was always about her and the wedding, her. And even when with, with Peter Townsend, he was always like five rows to the back. Ben Miles, who played Peter, just got always separated from us and sat next to an extra that chewed his ear off for three days straight in a church in Cambridge. Um, and um, so I, there were some feelings that I thought, are these mine or are these Margaret's? And I don't feel like that with, with Claire anymore. So I wonder well, whether it was... Gone. Some, mm. That's so interesting, because she, I'm sure, was, oddly enough, probably thinking queen-type thoughts about you, because <laughs> she would have been insecure whether she was doing it well, felt the part was more responsible worried about you feeling those. I mean, I thought what was so remarkable about The Crown is how, as it went on and on, it became more and more, seemed to be about our, my family and our lives and really normal mm. things. So it was the most extraordinary tale, but reduced actually all about jealousies and expectations mm. and all of that. I remember this is one I mean, she random. was very good, by the way. She's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> there was like lots of moments yeah. when I was like in the first season, I had no idea whether I was getting it right or not, and I was like snotting all over. And it was like, it was Jared Harris who played the king's we had the corp the corpse. It wasn't really him, thank God, because I had to come in in the morning and, and cry over his dead body, and I sort of did it as I thought Margaret would. It was just extremely emotional, very a great depth of feeling and a big range of of lots of things in, going on inside her, and there was literally snot coming all over. Thing. And I thought, well, does Stephen Daldry think I'm the worst actress ever? Because I just, am I overcooking this? And then Claire came in and did her thing, and all she did was sat down and she went, <gasps> and that was it. And I was like, oh my God, I'm over it. I'm over it. And there were several times like that where it was my close up, and I was going, Angie, you are like spit coming out, and I'm like eye bulging. And she was just, just so beautifully internal. And I just thought, have I got it horribly wrong? Um, I mean, I don't know whether you feel this, I, uh, and I don't know whether you guys have observed it, but I think we're in a really strange position of 
having the greatest generation of young actresses that I've ever seen. With you and with Claire and with Saoirse and with Jennifer Lawrence and with Kristen Stewart and with Brie Larson. There's this amazing, rich generation of young women. And they are not the same young mm. men. And I wonder whether men are now... Act, young actors, I find, are being forced to be more handsome and behaving in sort of more stereotypical ways. And women are allowed to be more interesting and emotional and complicated. I don't know whether you even think that's true, but I do think you're in a... It is a golden period for young mm. for actresses. I hope, I hope that's true. It definitely feels like this year is maybe there's a chance of it changing. But Richard, I mean, my God, I can't tell you the amount of times. I, I mean, nine out of ten scripts are just hopeless. All the parts are just um, underwritten, and it's always serving the male plot line. Yeah. It's like a, I, take, I, I think men take it for granted when they open a script that they at least will be either the protagonist or their part will be supporting the protagonist but his own journey and the women yeah. are usually the girlfriend of the wife of and that's what made this so amazing and it kind of set the bar for me really that um you can have a story about two women and the men are in relationships so, so philip's the husband of and peter townsend is the fiance yeah, of margaret yeah, yeah. not the other way around and that felt really unique and, and actually it felt incredibly empowering and i underestimated what that feels like and i maybe think that we are having to as actresses um push or, or campaign in some way or ask for parts that are written as well as the men have over the last however many decades in cinema. Yeah. I think there's way more on stage. That's, I think, why I started in theatre. And I always struggled to find the parts in films for women um, that were as good. Um, I mean, it is interesting. This year, of the ten nominees for the Oscars, six of them have leading women this year, mm. I think. It's a really unusual... Um, yeah, I know how you feel, by the way, because that's how I was with Rowan. Not very interesting yeah. <laughs> parts. Um, uh, one of the things I also uh, just we should talk about for a minute now is I do think we've got a generation, again, of young women, perhaps more than young men, who are using their position of fame to campaign for issues. Uh, and I really see it happening. And I re you know, the, clearly there's the Me Too issue, but a lot of g actresses have been campaigning for things before. And I think it's brilliant that you've taken this Margaret moment, as it were, to do stuff for Warchild. That, I mean, how did you suddenly think, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll exploit the moment, do more, and why Warchild? Mm. I'm so... I'm, I feel desperately lucky to be working on them because they are the group of the most amazing people but um and what they do is just beyond me i think i think i've been thinking about this a lot actually as a as an actress and feeling like i'm lucky enough to be in something which people actually watch because the amount of things you do apart from about time which lots of people watch <laughs> um you know on stage you're only it's only a, a group of people that comes and goes and then that's it's gone um so i'm, I'm not used to people seeing stuff in a way, apart from about time when you reach it. Um, I'm not going to so, ask him anyone here. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> well, it's all a bit of it. Yeah. Um, that's all I need to say. Yeah. That's, that's basically the fun. Um, but, but it is, it's, you know, and I always want to ask you about being a writer and whether it's a, any part of that is lonely. But I think as an actor, because you are your job and your kind of face is your job and there's so many elements to it and then it also becomes about wearing the right dress on the carpet, whatever that means. And I, I, that's a really weird thing to get your head around as being weirdly part of the job. Um, but it, it, it's, it's essentially a sort of a, self, a journey of, you can, you can be, you can, my fear is becoming self-absorbed in that way. Because it's about me and my thing and my job and my, you know, I'm the face, like the face of me. A very odd thing. And um, there's working with Warchild is completely, I just, I want to make it half of my life if I can. Because I think, I mean, there's one in six children that live in a conflict zone right now. And that is not just the threat of bombs, but everything else that comes with it. And what Warchild does specifically is which what I've got really interested in is, is, is look after the, the trauma and the mental issues that come with children surviving war. And if there's one in six kids that, have, that are in conflict zones, they're, they're going to inherit the earth. That's one in six people that have grown up in conflict. And when I um, try and create a character 
whether it be Margaret or anybody, I always look at the childhood. That's just my process. Some might just don't do that, I know. But with Margaret, it was, it was uh, just essential that I looked at what she was like as a little girl and how she was compared to Elizabeth. And there was this great quote about her shoving some sugar cubes in her mouth, like whenever she got them, whereas Elizabeth would divide them up all really neatly and nicely. And, and so finding the, what, what, what's made the adult in Margaret and what trauma in, of any level she's grown up with, um, which includes her being six and suddenly her sister's the heir because her uncle's abdicated and suddenly you're treated differently to your sister and everybody at parties is talking about your sister differently and you're stood right there and how that affects the child's psyche. And I don't think there could be anything worse for a child to go through than, than war and being in a war zone. And um, yeah, these Well, people I think it's brilliant that you're looking at it that way because that's, I'm sure, true. And unless we can see people whose lives are terrible in the context of our own lives, the more we think of them as being just completely different. Oh, um, there's a the responsibility, isn't it, for all of us to... And that's, this, this is my thing, I, you know. And they're really small and they reach like 160 kids at the moment and they could potentially reach the millions. I think it's like 357 million that are out there at the moment needing help. But anyway. So when, so when you fail your next audition, then it'd be yeah. great because you can say, I'll do more work for yeah, more child. Exactly. That's yeah, exactly. But though. I was, I mean, you, are, like Rich, I mean, you can't even compare what I'm doing compared to what you've done in your life. Oh. When did you decide that, that comic relief should be a part of I mean, when did you make that decision that you had to do something else other than think about yourself all day long? Well, the comic relief thing was, as I think of comic relief as my very difficult and unexpected child, because I did it once after Bob Geller for Dan Band Aid. A lot of us comedians just got together and said, well, let's do something on TV to try and raise money. And then it raised a lot more money than we thought. It raised 15 million pounds. In one you go? You just think, that's more than I'm going to earn in my whole life. And then we did it again the next year, and it was 27 million. And then you think, oh, I'm going to have to do this. It would be inhuman uh, not to do it. So it's just gone on and become part of, yeah, just become you know part of the rhythm of what I do. And I'm sure you'll be able to make that happen as well. Um, let's just go back to Tom for a second. I, I mean, I hadn't watched any of them before meeting him. So I had to binge watch five of them the night before. <laughs> That's a bit like the three sisters. A pattern is emerging that you know nothing. I know. I know. <laughs> you know nothing about... I knew nothing, absolutely nothing. I hadn't even watched the first one. So yeah. I did this binge, and my poor boyfriend was trying to sleep in, in the thing, and he was like, I just... All the theme music was going round. He said in the morning, he was like, I dreamt of helicopters all night. It was horrible. <laughs> I was like, I'm so sorry, I'm on number four. Um, <laughs> And then I like made loads of notes. I was like, okay, in number four, he climbs up the Burj Khalifa. Is that how you say it? Well, you don't yeah, know. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> have you watched though. any of them either? Anyway, and I wrote all these notes and of course went in and we didn't mention one thing about yeah. any of it. So it was a complete waste of time. <laughs> Most um, of life is doing homework that you never need. I know. Isn't it? That's it. I know. How do you, I've always wondered this because I think especially nowadays, to, you've, all your things have been so utterly original. They've like come from the, the a germ of an idea in your mind. So how do you, how do you materialise something from? Because I was saying to you earlier, like I, all I have to do is think about my own character's journey. I don't have to worry about. I just have to worry about Margaret. I don't have to worry about the Queen. I don't have to worry about any of the other things. But you have to worry about absolutely everything. I how love the way you think it's original. So we made four weddings. Yeah. And then went away, and I thought of this completely different film, Notting Hill, and we we made that, and then I watched it on the first night. I thought. It's exactly the same <laughs> as Four Weddings. There's an English guy played by Hugh Grant. There's an American woman. She goes away a lot. There are some English people who are his friends. Oh, no. Did you realise it at the, the time? Film. You only realised it after. Literally, it was the first time. Really? The first Just, time and no one said that to you, yeah. even the be no. any the way through? No, they were too polite. <laughs> And so what about Love Actually then? Because I, I heard that you, you, you made Love Actually in the edit. Is that true? Well, no, Love Actually was a... Love Actually was trying to... So two bits of Love Actually were meant to be whole films. And I thought, I don't want to go on making these romantic films if I now understand the form, because there's not much interest in that. So what I did is I just thought of a lot of stories I was interested in and said, let's just have the best scenes. So the Hugh Grant story was meant to be a whole film about a girl who goes to work there, they get to know each other and all of that and it messes up his political career. <coughs> and the, 
<coughs> the Colin Firth story was meant to also be a, a guy goes and spends a summer with his girlfriend somewhere and there's an attractive girl working in the house and then he goes back the next summer but he's alone and all of that. But what happened with Love Actually, which was quite um, demoralising, is when we had the read-through of the film, it seemed to work perfectly. And then we shot the film and then we looked at the edit of that film and it was a disaster. That's so weird. Yeah. I don't understand that. It was just there was something really visually... Movies do. You, they say you have to write a movie three times. You write it once, you shoot it, that's writing it again, you edit it, that's the third time. And it seemed to be that what happened is if you're telling ten stories and you just do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, which was sort of what I'd done... Actually, people just lose interest. They think there's no point in me focusing on this story now because now I'm going to know when it finishes, it's going to be another 18 minutes till I see it again. So we had to pull some of the stories forward and in some cases finish them halfway through. So it really was like three-dimensional chess because in a normal movie, someone robs a bank, they're going to get in the car and drive away. But in Love Actually, after every scene, you could go to any scene in mm. any of the other... That was such a headache, though, yeah, to work Yeah, so we out. delayed the release of the movie by three months, yeah, just to Trying to work it out. Did it, you think right? it was fixable at all? No, not most of the time, no. That's so mad, no. isn't it? How not much as bad as Bridget. Bridget was a real, was a disaster, real I disaster. thought I loved Bridget. No, uh, the, sorry, the, when we first watched it. Oh, well, in the edit. Because sometimes I'd watch my takes back on the monitor and be like, oh, my God, it was just, I can't, it's unbearable to watch. It's a very weird thing. But you guys can just sort it out in the edit. Yeah, we try, You can just we go on the back to. of my head and focus Yeah, it's so there. funny with actors because the edit is the director's revenge because you get yeah. all these gorgeous human beings and they're working with you. But at any point, you can just freeze the picture. So I've spent <laughs> hours in the edit with you looking like this. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be able to have that, a conversation that, with that. you yeah. like that. Um, but, or yeah. just cut me out the whole film. Or edits are really... Edits are um, actually a really joyful thing because things do just get better on the, on the whole. Can I ask you one thing, because I like this story, about when you, the first script you ever wrote, and that, and what happened, yes. that was so definitive in defining, beginning to define what kind of yes. writer you were then come It's with. why we're here now talking in North London, not in yeah. Beverly Hills. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the first script I ever wrote, which I th was um, called... Four Eyes and Fat Thighs, rather like four. And it was about a young man <laughs> and uh, his dad, both of whom discover on the same day. The boy discovers his girlfriend sleeping with his best friend and the dad discovers his wife is sleeping with his best friend. So they both move into a hotel. And I wrote the script and it was set in Boston. And I went to see the people at MGM and they said, this is amazing, this is a fantastic script. I said, oh, I'm so thrilled. Uh, and they said, except the two leading characters we don't like. Uh, and I said, why? And they said, well, they're both sort of weak. No one's going to admire them or want to spend time with them. I said, oh. Mm. And they said, the dialogue's very English. It doesn't really read American, so you'll have to work on that. And I said, oh, right. And then they said, which means that most of the jokes don't work because people won't get the, the humour. <laughs> So I said, that only leaves the title. That's the <laughs> only thing we've got. And they said, we hate the title. <laughs> you can't call it that. And I, I flew home two weeks later, and I swore I'll never do a film that's not set actually where I live. So the tall guy, my first film was called Camden, was really called Camden Tell Boy. And then there was Four Weddings, which was about all the weddings I'd been in Notting Hill. So that just scared me off completely forever off an American career. And then you wrote lots of lovely English ones. Yeah, and then just Because you are ones. a national treasure. I mean, for me, like, working on, um, yeah. working on About Time that summer, when people asked me about that, I was like, it was sort of like being in a Richard Curtis film. <laughs> I mean, yes. everything about it was just like, it was just like love and oh. Emma, who's amazing. That's mainly Emma. On, the la on, Rachel, on Rachel McAdams' last day, Emma hired an ice cream van which drove to the uh, set and she made Rachel put on a little outfit and then serve the crew ice creams just to say goodbye. Uh, 
Oh. And actually, I think Emma, in my audition, you were the only one that laughed all the way through it because that did not deserve as yeah. many laughs as it got. That was she was laughing you. at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she was. With you. she was. So I think our time is, is, is up, but it's up to you to ask any questions if you'd like to ask any questions. We've got a few minutes, don't we? Yeah. You can ask any questions of any type about anything. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm starting one new film in eight weeks' time, um, and it has got a romantic element in it, but it's also got a strong musical element in it, and it's not directed by me. So, um, yeah, so there's one more film, um, and then I'm going to become um, Vanessa's PR. Uh, <laughs> PR representative. Um, no, you can't do events like that. They're not paying you enough. <laughs> that uh, don't work for war child. Oh, come on, I don't get anything from that. Uh, yeah, so I've got one more film coming up, which we're just about to start making soon. Yes, sir. Can you name five of your favourite films? I think I know these of yours. Yeah. Um, yeah. You do one, I'll do one. You do one, I'll do one. Well, I know yours. Isn't that weird? Well, Godfather 1 and 2. Godfather 1 and 2, that is a good movie. Dog Day Afternoon. What are yours? I like the ones that Gina Rowland's in and Julie Christie and those women. I just always love watching those women. Like um, Women Under the Influence. Gloria is a great film. Have you yeah. seen that? Yeah, and actually one of our... Have you seen one of my, I haven't blank, seen, I've no. seen Women Under the Influence, which yeah. it was amazing. And uh, The Go-Between is a really extraordinary movie. I think one of the great... Un Heralded, really strange movie if you watch it again. Set in Suffolk, where we now live a lot. Um, Brief Encounter, I think, is the most perfect. Someone once said to oh, me, yes. are there any romantic movies where you think the characters would actually stay together after the end? Because certainly in mine, I mean, <laughs> Julia Roberts would have left Hugh Grant within about, <laughs> within about 20 minutes. <laughs> Um, but you do believe the couple in Brief Encounter are going to be together till they, till they die. But that's interesting that you've said movies with strong female leads, and did you always think that? Yeah. I'm interested in this more because mm -hmm. there are women playing the lead. Yeah. I just remember having conversations recently with just people, lots of producers, and I just say, why is a story about a man more fascinating than a woman? Why are the percentages? Have you just got to... Can I you think write? I think it's changing. I do. I mean, if you look at... What have I seen on TV recently? Collateral, which stars Kerry Mulligan. Requiem, starring Lydia Wilson. Kiri, starring Sarah Lancashire. I think things are beginning to really bend. Hopefully you just won't even notice. It's like you watch The Crown, it's, it's not about a woman, it's about a human. I think that's yeah. what... Mm. Yes? To Vanessa, what female leads have you always I've always wanted to find something like Woman Under the Influence, a film version, a modern-day film version of that. I'm really excited about playing Miss Julie, actually, because it's only an hour and ten minutes, by the way, which is the biggest draw for everybody. Um, and, uh, yeah, she's, she seems like similar essence to Margaret, so I'm really looking forward to it. But always, always people that have conflict in some way, that have two things going on. The best thing about Margaret is the fact that she so wanted to be different and live in a different time and push against where, where she belonged and yet was so the royalist of them all and the utterly a princess and those things were really interesting so women like that Hedda Garbo I've always wanted to do on stage just finding more parts like that on, on screen is a big ambition of mine bringing those sorts of stage roles to, to screen because I think like Margaret just felt like one of those and finding more like that is a big dream can you write me one really <laughs> <laughs> this is my audition <laughs> Yes, sir. It's very interesting what you said about your audition at MGM. Am I right in saying four weddings was actually launched in Spain before it came back home? Yeah. Was that deliberate? And could you get it more English than four weddings, which actually undid your interview or your audition? And are you surprised that the wonderful stars from four weddings so many of them went on to stellar careers. Gosh, I mean, uh, we did do four weddings first in America because when we tested it, which you have to do, it tested equally well. 
and it was sort of, I think the crying game had been a big hit in America the year before and then made money here. And everyone said, actually, if you release a small film, being able to say it's already been a hit in, the U in America, you might make more money. That was the reason behind that. Um, I, in a way, I'm not surprised by the cast doing well because Mike Newell was obsessive about casting. I owe so much to Mike, but there was one extraordinary occasion when we were doing, interviewing a character called Vicar Three. <laughs> and the guy walks in and Mike turns to me and says, Richard, tell Bernard about Vicar Three. And I said, well, he, he's, you know, he's, I've he's, for some he's doing like the wedding. He's, he's comes in, he finds Charles, the character. And Mike said, no, no. Why did he join the church? <laughs> and the guy only had two lines. Um, but Mike just looked and looked and looked so hard to find the double meaning in parts. And, you know... Kristen, who's so extraordinary in that, but I was just reading about her the other day, and I don't know whether you remember, but she lost her dad when she was young. She had so much pain in her and yet was so glacial, and we'd seen a lot of people who were glacial, but there was no real depth. And so I think Mike was looking for amazing actors to thicken out, genuinely, my quite sketchy film. <laughs> so um, I think that he was, it was his genius to find that, that cluster of, that cluster of Did people. you ever think it was going to be as massive as it was? No, I mean, I remember Mike, when we first heard we'd gotten to the Sundance Film Festival, saying, have they seen it? Have they? <laughs> uh, and I remember him describing it as a pig in a poke. And I said, really, Mike? We've been working on this for so long. But no, it, they had a, I've got a piece of paper where they guess how much it's going to make in each country. And by America, it's got zero. So, Isn't that funny? Yeah. I feel like that always happens. The Crown, and we didn't think anyone would watch either. And uh, I worked with John Borman, a brilliant director, and he turned down Jaws. And then when Spielberg turned, took it on, they, apparently there was the longest reshoot that went over and over and over and over, and they thought it was going to be hopeless, and then it was like the biggest thing ever in the yeah. 70s, wasn't it? It's quite weird. I think it's quite a good thing. Maybe I should just think everything's going to flop. I can't see... Mission Impossible, Fallout, <laughs> being anything except a massive triumph. <laughs> I have to say, I don't even know if Tom will be in it. I think it could, it could just be you, and then a shadow of someone hanging on to an airplane going by. <laughs> so there's, I think we've just got time for one more question, gentlemen, uh, yes, in the middle. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. What time are you going to? Hello? Yeah, I was going to say it's a question from the readers of Horse and Hound. <laughs> um, but, but, but clearly, that, that, that tells I you that, that, that Notting Hill is one of my favourite films. I must have seen it 20 times or something. But I remember growing up, I was in this sort of drab, grey council estate, and the life in Notting Hill, especially the dinner party scene, was the kind of life I always sort of wanted. And I just wondered, is that life you? Because your, your portrayal of life is so nice, and I like the way that you show English life and I just wonder is that you is it you know because not everyone shows life like that it's quite a nice well that's it's nice very, to see you know did that's you play the chocolate sweet. brownie game I mean I, I played that the chocolate brownie game <laughs> well I, I win a lot <laughs> um, just in for next time if you ever do watch that film again there's a cutaway to horse and hound and if you look at it carefully or freeze on it there's a leaf from a plant has fallen onto it because we got there on a the day and I saw, I said, they misspelt millennium. <laughs> so there was a spelling mistake on the horse and hound. So we had to put a plant over it and then drop a leaf <laughs> over the two ends. And another thing in Notting Hill, if, if you ever see it, there's a, we forgot to take a shot of the outside of the bookshop. So you cut to it three times and all three times over a two and a half year period, the same woman is tying <laughs> the laces. So you think it's a film about a love affair. It's one of those locked in syndrome. There's a woman who's there forever doing that. Do you know, I would only say about that, that I think that, um, I think all I'm trying to do 
is be as cheerful as your friends are at 10.30 at night when you're teasing each other and you've had a glass of two of wine to drink. We all know that kind of joy where the jokes tumble over and where people are on good form and you trust the environment. And I think that's what I've been trying to reproduce is something, because I actually I've never written a part as funny as my best friend Simon, you know, but I'm trying. And I think that that's the thing, just trying to remember what it's like when life is going well and then just slice off that very top bit and then try and capture it. So it's, it's no more my life all the time than yours, but it's remembering what the good bits feel like and seeing if you can find a I think there's only metaphor. one person in the country that does that, and that's you, Richard, and what an amazing gift. Oh. 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 So I think we should end there. <laughs> what a great night. <laughs>